Good afternoon. It's great to have you all in worship this afternoon. A special welcome to any guests or visitors that we have with us. We also have the Quarta Tertia Choir from um, Luther Prep here uh, edifying our service for this afternoon. We're continuing with our midweek Lenten services under the theme, His Final Steps. And the, today's theme is His Final Steps Led to a Dinner Celebration. We continue with the opening hymn, hymn number 784, Now the Light Has Gone Away. service can be found up on the screens. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, and our words, and our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus. Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. You may be seated. Our lesson for this afternoon comes from John chapter 12 and serves as the sermon text. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the hometown of Lazarus, who had died, the one Jesus raised from the dead. They gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. And Mary took about 12 ounces of very expensive perfume, pure nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was going to betray him, said, Why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He did not say this because he cared for the, pe- for the poor, but because he was a thief. He held the money box and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She intended to keep this for the day of my burial. Indeed, the poor you always have with you, but you are not always going to have me. A large crowd of Jews learned that he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus too, because it was on account of him that many of the Jews were leaving them and believing in Jesus. The Gospel of the Lord. We continue by singing the psalm, Psalm 138a, which is also the hymn, Your Praise is God I'm Bringing.
we bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we bow down to you in thankful praise. You have made us made your ways known to both lowly and great on earth. You have not abandoned the work of your hands, but instead you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will now view the Passion History video. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said. Or well, there may be a riot among the people. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. <laughs> when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. very sad and began to say to him one after the other surely not I Lord Jesus replied the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. At this time, we ask everyone to please fill out those attendance cards that are, can be found in the pew in front of you, and later on in the service when the offering baskets are passed, please place those cards in the basket. Another option is to use the QR code found up on the screen, and if you are watching online, there you can find a link above or below the video. Thank you for your cooperation. We continue with the next hymn, hymn number 394, Come to Calvary's Holy Mountain. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Dinner celebrations are probably some of the highlights of our lives. 
What I mean is, is all of us can probably think back to some dinner celebration of some kind that just sticks on our minds of just some fond memory that we have. Maybe it's one that you were, when you were little, or one that you did for your child on their birthday. And maybe you went to the child, your parents went to you and said, okay, it's your birthday, we're going to invite all these people over, and we're going to have a meal, and it's whatever you would like. Whatever your favorite food is, that's what we'll have. Maybe it was pizza, or hamburgers, or tacos, or something like that. It was a good, fun time. All these people came over, and you have fond memories of that here today still. Or here's another example of a maybe dinner party, if you want to call it that. What we have during Advent and here during Lent services, in between you can probably smell the smell of the soup wafting up from the basement of that chance to gather around in fellowship after or before the services during Lent and have fellowship with one another, enjoying a nice, wonderful meal. Or perhaps the biggest dinner parties of all that we can remember are maybe those that are connected to a wedding at the wedding reception. Those parties are ones that maybe take a year or more of planning that go into it, and, well, one that many people maybe look fondly back on and say, you know, that was a lot of fun. The food was great and wonderful. The music was great. It was a wonderful celebration. Especially if it was your own wedding, that party that you're thinking of, you probably look back at that with fond and wonderful memories. Well, our Lord and Savior had went to a number of wedding parties, or a number of parties then. You can say dinner parties while he was here on this earth during his ministry. You can see all the way back to, well, his first miracle. Where did that happen? But at a wedding party there in the, at the wedding in Canaan, where Jesus there turned water into wine. Quite a memorable event there at that person's wedding. Yet, we don't know how many dinner parties Jesus went to, but as we look through Scripture, we see plenty of examples. And, and as his enemies said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. It seems that Jesus made a constant habit of this. A constant habit to go to people's homes and eat and drink with them and have really what you could say dinner parties with them. We have another one recorded for us in our gospel lesson for today. Now this one takes place about six days before the Passover, as we see, which makes it about the Friday before Palm Sunday. So a week before Jesus would die for the sins of the whole world. And here we see, in a way, a very special dinner party happening. Happening. Here we see his final steps to a dinner celebration, one that would celebrate his limitless power and also his coming sacrifice. But as we look at this event in the Gospel of John, we, we want to stop and also look at Matthew and Mark and get a full picture of what was going on here and those accounts that they have recorded for us today. There we see that this happened, in, the dinner party happened in the home of Simon the leper. And maybe this is something that should give us pause. It took place in the house of Simon the leper. You see, in those times, leprosy was a great problem. It was a disease that, that spread to lots of people, and it was one that, according to the Levitical laws, it made the people unclean. It was a disease that there was really no cure for. It was a death sentence. It wasn't just the Jewish people who had these rules that say you had to stay away. It was other, other nations as well because they knew how infectious and how terrible this disease would be. It's one that the skin would basically rot off of you when you got this. Those Old Testament laws said that the people were unclean who had this. They had to, to leave their homes and their families, and they usually went to what were called leper colonies there, and their hair would grow out, they'd become disheveled, their, their clothing would be all torn up to mark them as somebody unclean that nobody could come near, because they didn't want to spread the disease, and they were also ceremonially unclean. So much so that if they saw somebody coming, they had to shout from a long distance, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, stay back. Where is this dinner party being held? It's being held at Simon the leper's house. So what does this mean then? Well, this must mean that Jesus healed Simon. Healed him from this disease that, that was one that was a death sentence that had really nothing coming back to him. One that it would shun him from his society. But here he had a house because God must have healed him through Jesus there. Or then Simon would go up before the priests and show themselves, present himself, and say, See, I'm clean. I have been healed. Must have been a sight to behold. Now, Simon probably would have been the main attraction at this dinner party to see that somebody who once had this death sentence of a disease healed, but, but there was somebody else there that people were focusing on. 
As we see here, it was also there, the hometown of Lazarus, who was reclining there at the table. Maybe you can think back to our readings last week. There, Our readings last week, we, we read about Lazarus and what had happened there. Where He had died and was dead for four days in the tomb to the point that he would have started smelling and stinking. Yet there he was, reclining at the day, table with Jesus. Now we begin to understand why this dinner party was one of a celebration of Jesus' limited power. People began to gather to see this sight, and you can understand why. Since this was Lazarus's hometown here, well, many of the people there probably knew that he was dead for four days. They probably saw the funeral procession go by. Maybe they even tended there the funeral to see, like, yes, he's been dead and gone for four days, but now he is alive. People would naturally want to go see Lazarus. So we see here that the soon the house was overflowing, a large crowd of Jews was coming to see who was there. And they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, who he raised from the dead. Maybe we should stop and put ourselves there and think maybe about what we would be thinking at this point. What would you want to ask and see? Maybe you'd go to Simon and you would want to ask him, well, what was it like to have that leprosy and be healed? Was your nose and your ears, were parts of you starting to fall off before? And what was it feeling like to have all that come back, everything come back so that you're restored to normal? Probably even more questions there for Lazarus. Maybe to go ask him, well, what was death like? Maybe that's something that we constantly wonder about, what death feels like, what, what it feels like, what it would eventually be like. Maybe you ask, well, what did you die from? Did your heart give out or, or did you fall? What, what happened here? How did you die? Do you have any lasting effects, or do you, are you even better now than you were before? All sorts of questions that could be coming. They're flocking to see these two people because what they had before them was proof of who Jesus was. Proof of his power and a celebration of his limitless power, over how he had power over death and all those diseases and everything here on this earth the chief priests began to be angry with this. We see in John chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, they said, the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus too because it was on account of him that many of the Jews were leaving them and believing in Jesus. There was living proof of Jesus' ministry and who he was. And perhaps those chief priests had another reason for wanting to kill Lazarus as well. As many of those chief priests, they were made up of the Sadducees. And the, the Sadducees were people who didn't believe in the resurrection. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both were enemies of Jesus for the most part. But the Pharisees at least would say, okay, we believe that there can be a resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees says, no, that's impossible. But there was Lazarus reclining at the table, living proof that what they said and what they believed was completely false and wrong. As we look at this dinner party in Bethany, we can't help but celebrate Jesus' limitless power and appreciate it. But do we always do that? Do we always please place our complete trust in the Lord who healed the untouchable leper like Simon? One whom we dress in our prayers as the physician of body and soul. Do we always trust in him to be that physician of body and soul and look over us? As we struggle, as we grow older, with more and more loss of loved ones in our lives, do we always try to find that peace and that confidence that's in him and that unwavering hope that he's always with us, that he holds the power over death, which is evident there, and has he raised Lazarus, Lazarus from the dead? Or do we sometimes despair and not trust in the hope that he has given us? Do we always trust in the words of Romans chapter 13, verse 11, that say, Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believe? Do we always see death as not the end of something, but the beginning? The beginning of eternal life forever, for eternity, perfection with our Savior. Doesn't this dinner party at Bethany shout to us at Jesus' words that have been proven as fact where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Yet we still have those moments where we fall prey yet again to doubt, doom and gloom and pessimism, worry and fear about our future, or maybe we wallow in self-pity or crushing lowliness. 
those times come, we want to look at this dinner party and see what it was. That these were his final steps in a dinner celebration there that show his power, but also the final dinner party in a way leading up to Holy Week, where he would take his final steps to the cross for you and me. Here we see this dinner party as a signal of Jesus' sacrifice for you and me. I really wonder how many dinner parties Jesus would have enjoyed in Bethany over the years. We, we know that this is where Mary and Martha were, right? And we, we can recount that other time where Martha was busy getting things ready to serve Jesus. But what was Mary doing? Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and listening closely, drinking in every single word that Jesus said. She loved to sit at his feet and just listen to these words of her Lord and Savior. And it's an example for us today to say we want to do the same. To sit there and listen and drink deeply into what Jesus has to tell us. This is because we see that Mary was listening. We see that by her actions. Mary knew that this was Jesus' final steps here. Final steps to die for her sins and the sins of the whole world. So what does she do? She took the better part of a year's wages and had that, that alabaster jar of pure nard, that perfume. The jar itself would have been extremely expensive, but the perfume it's, itself, too, was even greater in, in cost. And what does she do with this? She goes and takes this, and as we look at the Matthew and Mark's account, she anoints Jesus' head, and it pours down his body, and the, the scent, as, Jer, as, as John says here, fills the entire room. She also goes and, and puts it on his feet and, and lets her hair down and, and washes her, his feet really with it to show her love for him, to do something great and wonderful for her Lord and Savior, knowing what was coming. And what was Judas' reaction to this? We see his reaction of one of disgust, where he says, well, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He sounds great and pious there, right? Sounds so good. Oh, this money needs to be given to the poor. Yet we see his true intentions. He said this, or it says he did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He held the money box and used, to, used it to steal from it what was put into it. We can point the finger at Judas very easily here, and rightly so. But as we look at Matthew and Mark's account, what else do we see? Those disciples, well, they weren't listening either. They weren't understanding what was going on. And they said, why this waste? They didn't understand what Jesus was about to do. As what's evident with the rest of Holy Week, we know what happens where they run away in confusion and fear, not understanding what's happening, that all these things that Jesus said would happen needed to happen to save them and to save you and me. Never looking forward to the promise that Jesus made that he would rise again on the third day. So Jesus has to set them right. He says to them, leave her alone. She intended to keep this for the day of my burial. Instead, the poor you, or indeed, the poor you always have with you, but you are not always going to have me. See, Mary had her priorities straight. She was listening to Jesus, and she knew that her ministry was at an end. She knew that he was in his final steps. And it just turns out that those crowds that were gathered there to see Lazarus, to see Jesus, to see Simon, many of them, I'm sure, were gathered a week later, on Good Friday, shouting their approval of the Sanhedrin, bringing the death sentence down on Jesus to go and have him be crucified, even though he was innocent. What we see this dinner party really doing is signaling Jesus' coming sacrifice, one that he willingly went and did for you and me. Mary anointed him and really was starting the process that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus would, would do in haste and finish up the job later on on that Good Friday as they quickly tried to get Jesus buried before the Sabbath came, after he had died and paid for the sins of the entire world. Where there they took Jesus' body and, and bound it with linen strips along with spices in accordance with Jewish burial customs. As we look at this, we've looked at this dinner party and we see everything that's happening. The start of Holy Week there, we see Jesus' final steps. And each and one of those steps was one that was down, done out of love for you and me. 
So as we move forward in Lent, let's, let's look at Mary, how she listened and listened to everything that Jesus said and took them to heart, knowing that she was doing all this to sa- he was doing all this to save her. Let's also, this Lent, pay attention to Jesus, seeing at, that every step forward he was following his Father's plan to save us to the letter. That every step forward was made a step out of love for you and me. That every step proved and still proves his selfless love. Because he was willing to die for all of us, that we may be in heaven with him. Amen. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of praise and thanksgiving for our Lord and Savior. Please also place those attendance cards in the offering baskets as they are passed. As the offering is being collected, we will hear an anthem from the choir.
please stand for the responsive prayer of the church. Gracious Lord, according to your will and promise, you planned his path to the cross. He confronted the blindness of unbelief, the confusion of doubt, and the hurt of death. As we hear and contemplate the holy record of our Savior's passion and death, humble us as we view the Savior in his humility. In his sufferings, show us our healing. And in his death, show us our life. We pray the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the closing hymn.
Good afternoon. It's great to have you all in worship this afternoon. As I had mentioned there in the sermon, we have a meal then after the service. We would love everybody. You're all invited to its soup, and I think they have mac and cheese there as well. Um, that's down in the church basement. Uh, before we enjoy that wonderful food, uh, we can um, continue with the Lord, or the, not the Lord's Prayer, the common table prayers. Come, Lord Jesus, things on your evening. <laughs> 